Hi everybody! Welcome to another story time with Sid. It is me, Sydney of Hightower, as it is every week. And here we are again with another story. And this is it. This is the last section of this chapter of American Folklore. And then that's it. That's the end of the book. I can't believe that we have made it through this entire book of American Folklore. Thank you so much for joining me on this journey. I know, I... I d d emotions. <laughs> Thank you. Now, um, before I get too emotional, I should start reading some stories. Um, so let's go. This is called Feebled Feebledson. The hero of many tales of the Great Plains is Feebled Feebledson, a legendary Swedish pioneer. Here is Feebled struggling with the plains climate. What the plains country really needs is a good old drought buster. Back in the early days, there was never a drought ever came out of Kansas that Feebled Feebledson couldn't bust in 24 hours. Why shucks, he was just too good at drought busting. Feebled was always a good-natured cuss, but he really got peeved one year when the weather got hotter and drier and drowthier every day. It spoiled his fishing. This here is a sort of thing that has got to stop, Feebled said to himself and began to think. He always was a fast thinker. In a few minutes, he had thought of one more than a hundred ways to bust a drought. At that time, there were many lakes in the North Hills, just as there are today. Times have gotten so bad that the settlers immersed themselves in the lake several times daily to keep from drying up and blowing away. Feebled saw the solution to the problem. He built huge bonfires around these lakes and kept them burning for three weeks. In that length of time, the water in the lakes got so warm, it vaporized and formed clouds. These clouds bumped into each other, trying to get away from the lakes, and this section of the country received bountiful rains. After once being primed, the rains came again, and the country was saved. Was Feebled considered a hero? No. The Native Americans had no place to swim. The Swede also found the noise method a highly satisfactory way to make it rain. He recalled that it generally rained after battles, national conventions, and similar noisy affairs, but how to make enough noise? That was a problem. The people around him were too lazy to cooperate. They were so dry they couldn't speak. Feebled, however, wasn't a man easily stumped, not when he wanted to go fishing as badly as he did. He decided to enlist the aid of his fishing companions, the frogs, who had good, loud voices. But Feebled realized a frog would not croak unless it's good and wet. This difficulty was overcome in a minute. Feebled hypnotized a couple of frogs and told them it was raining. They began to croak with joy to spread the news. Soon every frog in the country began to croak at the top of his voice. In a few minutes, there was enough noise to drive, uh, drive everyone into a headache. According to specifications, the rain just poured down. Everyone was happy, especially Feebled and the frogs. That was one of the many ways to which Feebled resorted to rid the parched plains of drought. It could only be used once a season, however, because so much rain fell that the frogs were washed clear down to the Gulf of Mexico. It took a whole year for them to get back, ready for Feebled's next drowling, busting bout. And that was Feebled Feebledson. Hmm. It kind of seems like a trend creating uh, stories about human beings that somehow can manifest the weather. Um, the weather nowadays, I suppose it's, it's just, it's just, um, it's not as important as it used to be? That's not correct. Uh, hmm. Stories about the weather and man versus nature, they're just not talked about as much because a lot of human beings live in cities. We have modern amenities that make it not as difficult to us to exist in our environment. So that's why when you hear a lot of old folklore, a lot of it will deal with how things came to be, the environment, uh man versus nature, like I was saying. And nowadays, we have air conditioning, and we can stay in our homes, and we don't have to worry about it. I mean, in the Fey realm, we really don't have to worry about it because we have magic. Um, in the mortal realm, there's just science and mechanics, so... I mean, who knows? Science and mechanics, I do believe to be the mortal realm's version of magic, and who knows? There might be just a little bit of magic in the mortal realm as well. This is called How Hoop Snakes Can Sing. 
According to herpetologist Raymond Dittmars, the real hoop snakes is a slow-moving, burrowing species with a short terminal spine, but this is neither retractable nor poisonous. The pre-scientific hoop snake described here by a Pennsylvania yarn spinner is quite different. There have always been hoop snakes in Pike County. Maybe they don't have them in other counties, but then, maybe, they don't drink the kind of liquor made in Pike County. Well, anyway, there are hoop snakes in Pike County. Now, a hoop snake may be between 5 and 15 feet long and may be colored blue, green, orange, pink, or white and black, according to what the observer has been, thi has been drinking and how long he's been at it. Stories vary with the locality. In some parts of the county, they make whiskey out of apples. Some section make it out of rye. In other settlements, they make it out of radiator fluid. But while Pike County citizens honestly differ as to the color and size of the hoop snakes, they has a stinger on its tail that it rolls along by taking the tip of its tail in his mouth, which turns it into sort of a hoop. When it holds out its tail in its mouth, the tip is covered with a deadly poison. When the snake sees a victim, it lets go of its tail and spears whatever it aims at with the poison tail. Of course, there are a lot of skeptical folks who doubt this, but some people won't believe anything. Lots of folks don't believe that Jonas Wall the whale, but that doesn't prove anything. About the best hoop snake story I ever heard was the one told by old Bill Durham. Bill was a raftsman in the days when they ran rafts down the Delaware. Rafts from up Holly Way were made into bigger ones at Lackawaxen and floated down to Philadelphia. While they were making up the rafts, the rivermen stayed at the Williams Hotel just below the point where the Lackawaxen River empties into the Delaware. Yes, said old Bill, of course there's hoop snakes. Why, there was a feller down at, to Matamoris who had a little field close to the river. This feller was out hoeing corn one morning, and along about nine o'clock he was a leaning on the hoe handle resting. He looked up the corn row, and there was a big hoop snake rolling right at him. All he could do was stand behind the hoe handle, and when the snake struck at him, it hit the hoe handle close to the head. The feller was so scared he just ran for the house and let the snake stuck to the handle. Along about five o'clock, the feller started out to see what had become of the hoop snake. He had heard that snakes what get into fights die at sundown, and it was nearing dark then. So he stole back to where he had the fight with the snake, and sure enough, there was the snake, dead as the last spring shad. But the pison had swole the handle up until it was big in the saw log. Now this feller was a thrifty cuss, so he ran back, got his team, drug the log down to the sawmill and had it sawed up into shingles and shingled his barn with them. But when the first big rain come, it washed out all the poison and the shingles all shrunk up and fell off, so you could have seen it to this day. Sometimes when stories are written in accents, I really have no idea what they're trying to say. Poison was spelled P-I-Z-E-N. Pison. Like, like, pi, po <laughs> Pison. <laughs> uh, I really actually do love stories that are written in accents though because it really kind of envelops you into into the type of person that would tell this story because accents and dialects are all really important to humans. I mean, we talk about it all the time, right? Oh god, I say we like I'm immortal. I've been here for way too long. Um, but human beings really get into accents and dialects. They get really fascinated to find out where each other have come from. I mean, if you compare a Texas accent to a New Orleans accent or a Philadelphia accent, they're all wildly different. And it's amazing how that can be shown geographically and how you learn accents based on your area. I mean, I know stories of human beings that have acquired accents from living in other countries and they'd start adapting it they don't even realize it it's a really fascinating uh thing but about hoop snakes <laughs> i've never seen one if you have i'd love to hear about it but um it kind of reminds me of an ouroboros if you don't know what an ouroboros is it's basically a snake that's eating its tail um i've never heard of an ouroboros um releasing its tail to stab people with it, but maybe I'm reading the wrong stories. This is called Frozen People. The author and date of this eyewitness account of human hibernation are, un are alike unknown. 
It was reprinted from an old newspaper clipping in the Rutland, Vermont Herald in 1939. I am an old man now and have seen some strange sights in the course of a roving life, but none so strange as one I found recorded in an old diary kept by my Uncle William that came into my possession at his decease. The events described took place in a mountain town some 20 miles from Mont Montplier, the capital of Vermont. I have been to the place and talked with an old man who vouched for the truth of the story. The account runs in this way. January 7th, I went on the mountain today and witnessed what to me was a horrible sight. It seems that the, dwe the dwellers there, who are unable either from age or other reasons to contribute to the support of their families, are disposed of in the winter in a manner that will shock the one who reads this diary. I will describe what I saw. Six persons, four men and two women, lay on the earthy floor of the cabin drugged into insensibility while the families were gathered about them in apparent indifference. In a short time, the unconscious bodies were inspected by several old people who said, They're ready. They were then stripped of all their clothing except a single garment. Then the bodies were carried outside and laid on logs exposed to the bitter cold mountain air. It was night when the bodies were carried out into the full moon, occasionally obscured by flying clouds. Shown on their upturned, ghastly faces and horrible fascination, kept me by the bodies as long as I could endure the severe cold. Soon I could stand the cold no longer and went inside, where I found the friends and cheerful conversation. In about an hour, I went out and looked at the bodies. They were fast freezing. Again, I went inside. I could not shut out the sight of their freezing bodies outside, neither could I bear it to be in the darkness. But I piled on the wood in the cavernous fireplace and seated on a single block, passed by the dreary night. January 8th. Day came at length, but did not dissipate the terror that filled me. The frozen bodies became visibly white on the snow. The women gathered about the fire and soon commenced preparing breakfast. The men awoke and conversation again began commencing. Affairs assumed in a more cheerful aspect. After breakfast, the men lighted their pipes and some of them took a yoke of oxen and went off towards the forest while the others proceeded to nail together boards making a box about ten feet long and about half as high and wide. When this was completed, they placed about two feet of straw at the bottom. Then they laid three frozen bodies in the straw. Then the faces and upper parts of the bodies were covered with a cloth. Then more straw was put in the box and the other three bodies placed on top and covered the same as the first ones with cloth and straw. Boards were then firmly nailed on top to protect the bodies from being injured by carnivorous animals. By this time, the men who went off with the ox team returned with a huge load of spruce and hemlock bows, which they unloaded at the foot of the steep ledge, came to the house and loaded the box containing the bodies onto the sled, and drew it out to the foot of the ledge near the load of bows. These were soon piled on and around the box, and it were left to be covered with snow. We shall want our men to plant our corn next spring, said a youngish looking woman the wife of one of the frozen men, and if you want to see them resuscitated, you come here about the 10th of next May. With this agreement, I left the mountaineers living and frozen to their fate and returned to my home in Boston, where it was weeks before I was fairly myself, as my thoughts would return to that mountain with its awful sepulchre. May 10th. I arrived here at 10 a.m. after riding four hours over muddy, unsettled roads. The weather here is warm and pleasant. Most of the snow is gone, except here and there are drifts in the fence corners and hollows. I found the same parties here I left last January to disinter the bodies of their friends. I had no expectation of finding any life there, but a feeling that I could not resist impelled me to come and see. We repaired at once to the well-remembered spot. The snow still lay deeper on the bottom of the pile. The men commenced to work at once, some shoveling and others tearing away the brush. Soon the box was visible. The cover was taken off, the layers of straw removed, and the bodies, frozen and apparently lifeless, lifted out and laid on the snow. Large troughs made, it, made out of hemlock logs were placed nearby filled with tepid water, into which the bodies were placed separately with the head slightly raised. Boiling water was then poured into the trough from kettles hung on poles nearby until the water was hot and I could hold my hand in. Hemlock bows had been put in the boiling water in such quantities they had given the water the color of wine. After lying in the bath about an hour, color began to return to the bodies when all hands began rubbing and chafing them. This continued about an hour when a slight twitching of the muscles of the face and limbs followed by audible gasps showed that life was not quenched and that vitality was returning. 
The spirits were then given in small quantities and allowed to trickle down their throats. Soon they could swallow, and more was given to them. When their eyes opened, they began to talk, and finally sat up in their bathtubs. They were taken out and assisted to the house, where, they had, where after a hearty meal, they seemed as well as ever, and in no wise injured, but rather refreshed by their long sleep of four months. Truly truth is stranger than fiction. And that was called Frozen People. Well, you know, I, you know, as I read that, I don't know if that's true or not. And I know, I know, I know that sounds crazy, but here's the thing, is that human beings in, in small rural, rural cities sometimes have the strangest magic. I mean, think about it. They used hemlock to revive the bodies. Like, is there anything that sounds a bit witchier than that? I don't know. It's fascinating, though, to think that could be a possibility. Though I, I really don't understand the point. I mean, un unless I suppose they were worried about having enough food in the winter to feed all those people, so they said, "Oh, well, you'll go to bed. We'll stay here in the winter. We'll wake you up." But I'd be scared about never waking up. And just going through all that, not to come back. I don't know. That's so fascinating, though. What a concept. The, this is called Snipe Hunters. I think I've heard one or two stories about snipes when I was younger. To rural and small town Americans, the practical joke was a favorite escape from monotony and isolation, especially if it could be played on a dude from the city. Probably the granddaddy of all American practical jokes is the hunt for the non-existent snipe. Here, in one of Vance Randolph's tales from the Ozarks, it is given an added Philip. One time, there was a fat man come to the boarding house, and the folk said he was from New York. He used to sit around of an evening and listen to the boys talking. One night, they asked him if he'd like to go snipe hunting, and he says yes. The boys figured it would be fun for them, and an educational experience for the fat man from New York. The whole crowd went out in the timber, pretty near Reed's Spring, and they lit a candle about two inches long and set it on his stump. Then they gave the fat man a little tin whistle. They gave him a toe sack, too, and showed him how to prop it open with a willow stick. That there whistle is the best sniper collar in this county, they told him. Just keep it tootin' good and loud. That will fetch them snipes into the light, just like moth millers. And when they see that black shadow where you got the sack propped open, they'll fly right into it every time. All you gotta do is wring their necks. The fat man, he sat down and got ready to catch the snipes. Where are you fellows going, he says. We're going out to beat the brush for half a mile each way, says one of the boys. That kind of stirs up the snipes and get them into circulating around good. So the fat man began to toot his whistle, and the boys scattered out into the brush. They figured on stirring around and hollering for a while, and they would all go home and leave the fat man to get back the best he could. Everybody thought it was a great joke to plan a fellow from a big city like New York. The boys whooped and hollered up and down them hills so they was pretty tired, and then they walked all the way back to town. When they got to the boarding house, they heard a funny little noise, and they seen the light in the fat man's room, and there he was, setting a big easy chair and shooting his tin whistle. When he seen them fellows all dusty and briar scratch, the fat man laughed so hard he mighty near strangled. You boys will be the death of me, says he. That's the first time I've been snipe hunting in 40 years. I didn't know they had snipe hunts anymore. Finally, one of them fellows wanted to know how he come to beat everybody home. And the fat man laughed one more. I got Bob Applegate to follow along in the buggy, says he. You wise guys were still hollering and tromping down brush when we left. That fat fellow stayed around town pretty near all summer. And every night he would set out the gallery and toot his little tin whistle. The folks in town all knowed about the snipe hunt, and the fool boys never did hear the last of it. And that was snipe hunting. It is, you know, some people think, why would you lie to children and other people just to play a practical joke on them? That That's not very nice. But there is something kind of cute about the, the uh, tradition of snipe hunting, because American children all over who live in the country have had their parents or older siblings or older cousins or people that know better 
send them on snipe hunts, whether that's to get them out of the house, to get them out of their hair, or to just see them run around like idiots for a little while. And there is something adorable and wholesome about that. There's something really cute about seeing someone try so hard for something that, well, isn't real. As long as it's in a wholesome way and not in a destructive way. And as long as everybody's safe. Yeah. And the funny thing about snipes is that everyone describes them differently. Sometimes people describe them as bugs. Sometimes people describe snipes as birds. Sometimes people describe them as a hybrid of the two. It, it really is unique to whoever's telling you that story. And that's the beauty of oral storytelling is that it can change. And then you get people growing up and they tell you about how they went snipe hunting and what their, their experience was like. And you can all kind of chuckle a little bit at how silly and naive you were. I find it wholesome, in the best way. Anyway, this is called fur-bearing trout. Fur-bearing trout have been record reported in the streams of Maine, Michigan, Pennsylvania, Arkansas, and Colorado. Here is an account of this strange creature's origin and how they, mess they may best be caught. The town of Leadville, Colorado was incorporated as a mining town in the year of 1878. It was during the winter of 1877 and 18, 1878 that meat was supplied to the miners in the form of venison by professional game hunters. Now during those winter months, the miners ate so much venison and fried potatoes that the venison tallow became caked to the roofs of their mouths to the extent that they were unable to taste their coffee and other beverages. This was indeed distressing, and often they eliminated this handicap by wiring a bundle of pitch splinters on the top of the heads of their heads and setting fire to it. The result was that the tallow was melted and they gain they again had the sense of taste. But the net result was nearly ninety seven percent of the miners in the camp became bald headed. About the middle of spring a gentleman from Kentucky who had been in the hair tonic business in that state reached camp. He was a Republican and had left his state to avoid the trouble with government tax agents who tried to collect a heavy tax on his product. In time, he started to manufacture his hair tonic from potatoes on a small creek down in Leadville and had to sell his product to the miners of the camp. It was on a rainy summer evening that he was coming to town with four jugs of hair tonic, one in each hand and one under each arm. It was necessary for him to cross the trout stream which empties into the Arkansas River on a foot log. In so doing, he slipped and had to drop two of the jugs to retain his balance. The result was that the falling jug struck rocks into the stream and were broken, spilling hair tonic into the water. Not long after that, the trout fishermen of that vicinity changed their methods. Instead of the usual rod and reel, they would go down to the creek on a Saturday afternoon, stick a red, white, and blue pole in the bank, put on a white coat, wave a copy of the police gazette in one hand, and a and brandish a pair of scissors in the other, and yell, NEXT, until they had the limit of these fine fur-bearing trout with full beards, etc. The trout would leap onto the bank after these tonsorial lures, and were picked up by the fishermen. This practice continued until the mill trailings from the mills riled the water so that the trout could no longer see the barber poles. And that was fur-bearing trout. There's nothing to say about that other than that's adorable, and I really want a picture of a fish with a beard now. Um, this is called Slappy Hooper. Tall tales about workers at their jobs usually contain a good deal of occupational information and technical detail. In this one about a sign painter, you will encounter such terms as anti-goggling, uh, which is slant-wise or crooked, pounce, which is a perforated outline or stencil for unskilled painters, boil up water for boiling clothes to kill body lice, and public works used to mean the routine factory jobs such as independent craftsman scorn. Slavy Hooper wasn't big because he was six foot nine wide between the eyes. No more than he weighed 300 pounds with his cap on or his bucket in one hand and his brush on the other. It was just that there wasn't no job any too big for Slappy and he never wanted a helper to mess around with. Even when he was painting a high stack, he didn't want any rube staggering and stumbling around the lines of his bosom's chair. He knew too well that lots of times a helper can be more trouble than he's worth. 
He'll yawn and gape around or send up the wrong color or the wrong brush, or he'll throw rocks at birds or make goo-goo eyes at dames passing by. Like as not, he'll foul the lines and pull the wrong one and send you your butt over appetite to kingdom come. Sloppy said his life was too short to take a helper to raise up. He could let himself up and down as fast as a monkey could skin up a coconut tree or a cat like his hind legs with his leg up and his tongue out. Anything Sloppy wanted on the ground he could lasso with his special long and tough rawhide lariat and pull it up to where he was working. Sloppy done some big jobs in his day and he done them right and fast. He says if there ever was a crime against nature this was the way they got out of here late of blowing paint on with a spray gun like you were slaying cockroaches or bedbugs or pacifying a cow to keep the flies off of her until she can get milked. Sloppy liked to splash it on with a good old 8 inch brush and he never was known to leave a brush lap or a hair on the surface when the job was finished. Slapping it on up and down or slapping it on crossways or anti-logging you couldn't tell the difference. It was all of a solid sheet. With all these new inventions, like smoke writing from airplanes and painting signs from a pounce, even, pi even in pictures they do it that way, it's hard to appreciate an old-timer like Slappy. He used to get jobs of lettering advertising on the sky, and it didn't fade away in a minute like smoke that pours out of a plane and gets torn to pieces by the wind before you can hardly spell out what it says. It was all pretty in fancy colors, too. Any shade a man's heart could wish for, and it'd say right there for days that the weather was fair. Of course, birds would fly through it, and when it rained, the colors would all run together, and when the clouds rolled by, there'd be what folks call a rainbow. It really was nothing but slappy hooper sky riding all jumbled together. No man, woman, child, or beast, alive or dead, was able to go invent a waterproof sky paint. If it couldn't have been, if it, if it could have been done, Sloppy would have done it. Nobody ever did understand how Sloppy managed to do the sky painting. He'd have been a chump to tell anybody. He always used to say when people asked him, that's for me to know and you to find out. Or, if I told you that, you'd know as much as I do. The only thing people were sure of was that he could use sky hooks to hold up the scaffold. He used a long scaffold instead of the bosom's chair. When he started, it to, when he started in to fasten the sky hooks, he'd rent a thousand acre field with, and rope it off with barbed wire charged with electricity. He never let a living soul inside, but you could hear the booming sounds like war times, and some folks figured he was firing the skyhooks out of a cannon, and that they fastened on a cloud or someplace too high for mortal eyes to see, or mortal minds to know about. Anyways, after a while, if you took a spyglass, you could see Slappy's long scaffold raising up, up, up in the air, and Slappy about as big as a spider squatting on it. But that played out somehow. It wasn't that people didn't like his sky painting anymore, but the airplanes got to buzzing around as thick as flies around a molasses barrel, and they was always fouling or cutting Slappy's lines, and he was always afraid one would run smack into him and dump over his scaffold and spill his paint as if nothing was worse. Besides, he said, if advertisers were dumb enough to let an airplane take the place of an artist, the more he'd fool them, and it wasn't no skin off his behind. He could always wangle three scare squares a day and pat at night by putting signs on windows for shopkeepers if he had to. If I can say off public works, I'll be satisfied, he thought to himself. So Sloppy said, to hell with the big jobs, I'll start painting smaller signs, but I'll make them so real and true to life that I can still be the fastest and bestest sign painter in the world. If I ain't the biggest anymore, it's pure foolishness for a man to try to match himself against an airplane at making big signs. One of Sloppy's first jobs after he took to billboard painting was a picture of a loaf of bread for a bakery. It would make you hungry just to look at it. That was the trouble. The birds began to fly on it, to peck at it, and either they'd break their bills or starve to death because they didn't have anything left to peck with, or they'd just sit there perched on the top of the billboard trying to figure out what was the matter until they'd just keel over. Some of them break their necks when they dash against the loaf, and others try to light on it and slip and break their necks on the ground. Either way, it was death on birds. The Humane Societies complained so much that Sloppy had to paint the loaf out and just leave the lettering. He didn't like this a bit, though, because, as they often said, any monkey who can stand on his hind legs and hold anything in his fingers can make letters. The loaf of bread business sort of gave Sloppy a black eye. People were afraid to hire him. Finally, the Jim Dandy Hot Blast Stove and Range Company hired him to do a sign for their newest model, showing a fire going good inside. The jacket cherry red and the heat pouring off of ever, in ever which direction. In some ways, it was the best job Sloppy ever had. 
The dandelions and weeds popped right out of the ground on the little plot besides the billboard and the sidewalk, and in the middle of January, the coldest winter ever recorded by the Weather Bureau. It was when the bums started making the plays a hangout that the citizens and storekeepers of the neighborhood put in a kick. The hobos drove a nail into the billboard so that they could keep the heater so they could hang kettles and cans against the side of the heater and boiled their shave and boil up water. They pestered everybody in the neighborhood for meat and vegetables to make mulligan stews. They found it more comfortable on the ground than in any flop house in the city, so they slept there too. They ganged up on the sidewalk so you couldn't push through, even to deliver the United States mails. Mothers was afraid to send their little children to school to the grocery store. The company decided to hire a special watchman to shoo hobos away. But this was a terrible expense. Not only that, but the watchman would get drowsy from the warmth and no sooner did the did he let out a snore than the bums would finally come creeping back like old home week. Finally, the company got the idea of having Sloppy make the stove a lot hotter to drive the bums clean away, so he did. He changed the stove from a cherry red to white hot and made the heat waves a lot thicker. This drove the bums across the street, but it also blistered the paint off of all the automobiles parked at the curb. Then one day, the frame building across the way began to smoke and then began to blaze. The insurance company told the Jim Dandy Hot Blast Stove and Range Company to jerk that billboard down and be quick about it or else they'd go to the law. Slappy says now he feels like locking up his satchel and throwing away the key. They don't want big sign painting and they don't want true to life sign painting and he has to do one or the other or both or nothing at all. And that was... Sloppy Hooper. Aww. Imagine, you know, it's kind of like earlier in this in this chapter when, you know, you're so good at something, people ask you to stop. <sighs> when you're so good at something, so good at art, that people believe that it's real. What a beautiful and amazing artistic talent. Can you imagine if that person really got to just painting portraits? They would kind of be like the portraits from Harry Potter where people would go walking around. Anyway, human beings have their own form of magic. I, I have decided, officially. Whether that's uh, in, the, in storytelling, in tall tales, or whether that's in practical magic. Jim Bridger Overcomes Gravity. Frontiersman Jim Bridger told truthful stories about his explorations in the Yellowstone and elsewhere, but other yarn spinners stretched the truth so far that old Jim Bridger's lies became famous. The following is just one of the lies in a long tale about a petrified mountain. Old Jim Bridger one evening after a long day's ride was jogging into a familiar camping place in the region of petrification. Without warning, he came upon a hidden and pre precipitous chasm which blocked his way. Exhausted as both he and his horse were from his long march, he was comparatively disheartened by this obstacle passage of which might well cause him several hours of strenuous exertion and carry him far into the night. Riding up to the brink of the recon reconnoiter, Bridger found that he could not stop his horse, which kept moving right along as if by its own momentum, out over the edge of the precipice, straight on at a steady gait and on a level line, as if it supported by an invisible bridge. Almost before he realized it, he was safe on the far side. His amazement at this miracle soon abated, however, when he remembered the strange character of the surrounding country, and he was forced to the conclusion that this chasm, as others in the Yellowstone region, were simply a void which gravity itself had become petrified. And that was Jim Bridger Overcomes Gravity. So you're saying that gravity was so scared that it just stopped working and you could just walk right across the chasm. Stranger things have happened. This is called <gasps> the Sea Bees! What? The Fighting Man, writes the collector of his and other servicemen's tales, is a natural born exag exaggerator. In his own mind, he's a combination of Paul Bunyan, John Henry, and Dick Tracy. Soon after joining the Navy, I was stationed at a, the Sea Bees paint shop where I learned that my work was to include camouflaging and lettering. Our crew gradually became very efficient at camouflaging and went about that phase of work with great eagerness. However, this same eagerness almost landed us in the brig more than once. It all started when we camouflaged a long fence so thoroughly that three platoons of men marched right through it. 
Two valuable weeks were wasted while a group of carpenters searched for the broken place, and when they did find it, they had to station a man there night and day so that they wouldn't lose track of it again until it was fixed. You can imagine everyone's amazement when four new tires came rolling down the street in perfect formation and came to a dead stop simultaneously. It wasn't until one of the boots tried to roll one away for his personal use that we discovered that the four tires were holding up an officer's station wagon that we had camouflaged. We hadn't had time to paint the tires, which was fortunate, because if we had, the wagon would have never been found. All this was only the beginning. In our hurry to finish the camouflaging, the base before inspection was painted so fast and so furiously that we painted each other, and the whole crew couldn't be seen. Until we could get enough paint off, we recognized we were charged with being AWOL for three days. Well, sir, on top of the whole business, the inspecting ad admiral couldn't find the base. He traveled all the way up to New York to Florida to look for it, and if we hadn't erected the big sign at our base entrance, which is home of the sea bees, he'd still be traveling. And that was the sea bees. Ah, uh, mortals do like to make that joke. At least American mortals like to make that joke whenever you're wearing camouflage. And like, I can't see you. Where would you go? It's very funny. All right. Yarns, tall tales, and practical jokes. Some of the gags, hoaxes, and tall tales of American folklore are illustrated on these pages. Reading counterclockwise from the top and left is a goofus bird, which flies backwards because it doesn't care where it's going. Between Sky Painter and Sloppy Hooper and the flying upland trout stands on the tripadero, which, shoot, which shoots clay pellets from its beak. Bearded Tony Beaver swings his patterns at the big music while roadrunners wall up rattlesnakes until they die of their own bite. The tenderfoot hoaxed into a snipe hunt will soon be sent to fetch the shoreline. Between the gold-plated drawers and the fur-bearing trout is a shoe fly, which feeds by diving in a bubble. Below the giant Nebraska pumpkins and grasshoppers is an ice worm cocktail, a Klondike favorite. The Gilly Galoo, which lays square eggs, roosts near its feebled feebledson with the drought-busting fogs, and a groundhog forecasting a prolonged winter for human hibernators. To the egress is P.T. Barnum's famous sign, which fooled sideshow patrons who thought there was an animal called an egress into going out. Behind them is a Swan Valley monster that squirted poison, and above it, the fearsome hoop snake. The hobo special climbs a big rock candy mountain. A little mosquito of Florida flies off with a human victim. On the corn stalk is the farmer whose corn grew faster than he could climb down. Jim Bridger rides on petrified air towards an undignified petrified man. Below them, Davy Jones's locker opens for drowned sailors, and big Texas wind blows Dan, Dad Thornburg around. There are so many, so many beautiful illustrations here. I don't know if you can see any of them, but we're going to, we're going to try. There are so many wild stories that Americans have in their folklore. And no doubt that there are so many more wild stories that other countries have as well. Perhaps one day we'll delve more into other countries' folklore, but for now, we have finished this book of American folklore. Thank you so much for joining me on this journey. I know I said it before, but I can't really put into words how much I appreciate you joining me through this. You know, when I first started reading these stories, it was because I couldn't really study human beings in person because of the global pandemic. Everything was shut down. I couldn't interact with human beings anymore, which was the goal for being here in the mortal realm. But now things are opening back up. More people are getting vaccinated. More people are feeling safe to go out. So now I don't necessarily have to read stories anymore to get a good grasp of why human beings are the way they are. I think reading these has certainly helped, and I think that there's a lot of really amazing things that you can learn about human beings by delving into their history and delving into their storytelling. But now I get to hear it from human beings firsthand, and I'm really excited about that. I have no idea what's going to happen to this series once the world is fully open. 
I hope that I will still have time to do the things that I love and read these stories with you and for you. But no matter what happens, I am so glad for the time that we got to spend together. If this is your first time tuning in, or if this is your fourth, or if you've been here the whole time, thank you. I appreciate the heck out of all of you. And I hope that you're all staying happy, healthy, and safe. I have no idea what I'm going to read for next week. I think it's going to be a little bit of a surprise. But I'll be here. And I hope you'll be here too. Thank you so much. Goodbye!